Good morning. My name is Tom Armstrong. I am the VP of Global Advertising for the New York Times. And I'd like to welcome you all to the New York Times Climate Hub. Over these next few days, the Climate Hub will be home to influential business leaders, policymakers, innovators, scientists, and multi-generational actors, all joining forces with the wider community here in Glasgow to debate, discuss, and discover actionable climate solutions together while these trees bear witness. Now, before the session kicks off and my colleague Tom Friedman leads the discussion, I want to take a moment to thank Leaps by Bayer for sponsoring this session. Thank you to our audiences, both here in Glasgow and tuning in virtually around the world. As a reminder, for those who are tuning in virtually, please don't forget to submit your questions to the broadcast. Thank you very much. Climate change is the challenge of our generation. At a moment when distance has made our worlds and disciplines more siloed, discussions that bring together diverse stakeholders are just so important. I'm grateful to the New York Times for bringing us together in Glasgow and virtually. Collaboration is the only way we will innovate ourselves out of the climate crisis. This is especially true in areas that touch all of us, like food and farming. Leaps by Bayer is tasked to invest in breakthrough technologies with the potential to address 10 huge challenges or leaps. Agriculture today faces a monumental challenge to dramatically increase the quality, diversity, accessibility, and nutrition of the food we grow while reducing the use of land, water, and ultimately its impact on climate change. We see it as our responsibility to rise to these challenges and work together. I'm sure you are as eager as I am to gain insights from this esteemed panel into what's really at stake at COP26. I hope you enjoy the conversation. Good morning. Uh, yeah, wherever you'd like, Ross. And you want to sit here with me? Well, welcome everybody um, uh, to our kickoff panel. And um, what better way to kick off um, this uh, climate hub for the New York Times and uh, at this uh, COP than a panel that asks the question, what's happening? Um, and I can't think of three people I'd rather ask that question to. Uh, uh, Laurence Tubiana, who heads the European Climate Foundation and um, was special uh, ambassador to the Paris COP, where we first met. Uh, Johan Rockström, who uh, is one of the world's best and, and uh, smartest earth scientists, runs the Potsdam Institute, also works with Conservation International. Uh, and Andy Karsner of uh, Elemental Labs, uh, who serves on the board of Applied Materials um, uh, and um, Conservation International and ExxonMobil. Um, and so uh, welcome everybody, welcome to all of you. Um, I'm gonna just start out uh, by copying from the, from the question. Uh, Laurence, why don't you kick us off? What's happening? What has happened from your perspective since Paris? And um, are we making progress? Are we going backwards? Give us your update. <clears throat> um, it's a quite ambivalent perspective. If I look at the landscape, just, yeah. you know, it's uh, on one side, and, and in a way, my metaphor is Glasgow could be the city of the two tails. One, which is mobilization. Well, hold up your microphone, yeah. I think people can even, even just hold it up. Yeah, yeah okay. perfect. So one perfect. is really um, the tale of a mobilization. You, you have seen all these net zero by 2050 commitments. And I can tell you, it was the last negotiation at the last hour of the last day to have net zero and 1.5 including in the included in Paris Agreement. So on that side, you, you see companies, local authorities, government, more than 100 countries committing to net zero. So that's a tale of mobilization and corporates and businesses and investors. On the other side, there is another tale which is frustration and anger, which of course you, you see not only outside the COP, but as well inside, because you heard maybe the President of Barbados, I think it was Monday. President Barbados. Yeah, Barbados. Uh -huh. Impressive 
speech of a, a very cold anger around the delay we are, we are just witnessing. So it's, I, we are in the middle of, of, the, of the river now. Uh, Glasgow is a moment of truth and honesty about what we can deliver, have delivered. And I think it's a moment of mobilization and acceleration. Some good things have came uh, since Paris. You see some sectors moving much quicker than we anticipated in Paris, like the electrification of transport, even, of course, all the time, the cost of clean energy. We see now, again, much more the coal phase out is beginning to be concrete and, and real. But still, we still have oil and gas exploration and new fields. We still, where IEA said we should stop that now, we still have the idea that we should really build more and more pipelines for gas when we know that we'll be stranded assets in the future. So that's why, I don't know, I think we have to accelerate action. That's my only response. We don't know if we can get it, but we are, we, I think the bet we have to do is really accelerating action, asking countries to present new NDCs even next year, companies to be really serious. So this is a whole movement of acceleration of real action that I will feel we, we get the, on the right side of history now. Well, aren't you a little worried, though, that we're doing more greenwashing than green making? Yeah, for me, for me, and I'm very sad to say that, greenwashing is now the new climate denialism. It's a new way to say climate doesn't exist, but it looks better. And for me, it's even more dangerous than the climate denial was, because it's, you know, we have to combat the, the, the bad data. And that's why I would like we transform the net zero by 2050 by a formula, which will be what is a true zero? Talk about truth. Talking about truth and honesty, what is a true zero? That, that's the moment, because we need that to be. And we have seen some scientists saying, just it's, it's not serious. We, we, we are now, these net zero commitments are all about offsets and not real emission reduction. So that's why I think now we should talk about how we get really honest and truthful. Because you know, tr trust was a essential, essential element for Paris Agreement. If we didn't have trust between the different parties, we could not have the agreement as ambitious as it, yet it is. But then we cannot, so it's so important. So I do think that now we should be really being, okay, we have these commitments, make them real, make them honest, don't pretend, don't pretend, tell the difficulties, describe the difficulties, but just deliver. And that's why I think we should move from net zero to true zero. So, Johan, let's pick up right there. Um, from an earth sciences perspective, can we still stay below 1.5 degrees C? Mm. Yeah, so that's, I think, the big question at this point. And uh, if, if, if the journey from Paris until here has been a question of, of arbitrary mobilization, as you point out, Laurence, I would say that the journey from scientific perspective from Paris to Glasgow is, is a journey of very, very strong confirmation scientifically. Hmm. We exited Paris with, with uh, an agreement of aiming for 1.5. It was a political agreement at the last hour. What's happened since then is that we have so much scientific verification that this is a biophysical climate planetary boundary. You go beyond 1.5 and we start having you know, really big extreme events, impacts on communities around the world. We're also having irreversible commitments if we pass 1.5. I mean, just look what at the IPCC. What does that mean, irreversible commitments? Well, just, just to give you one, one statistic here. So the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change in the sixth assessment concludes that already at 1.5 degrees Celsius, I mean, meeting our target for Paris would commit all future generations to at least two meters, two meters of sea level rise. It's irreversible, so it's an unstoppable commitment. It would take 2,000 years before we meet it, but it would be a drift that we cannot stop. How can that be? How can 1.5 have such big, big impact? Well, it's for one, it's the warmest temperature over the past at least 100,000 years. You know, the warmest temperature since we left the last ice age is 1.1 degree. We already passed that point. Wow. So we have more and more scientific evidence that not only does does extreme events, disease, fires, heat waves, droughts, floods increase? But we also have more and more scientific evidence that we risk crossing thresholds that, that would lead to irreversible shifts from, from 
systems that are resilient and able to, to dampen and cool rainforest, wetlands, permafrost, ice sheets, the ocean heat circulation, and that they, you know, 10 years back, we thought that the risk of crossing tipping points was perhaps at two, three degrees Celsius. Now we have more and more evidence that, that the, f the planet is more fragile than we thought. We know that the West Antarctic ice shelf has probably already passed the threshold. Tropical coral reef systems has already passed the threshold. The Arctic summer sea ice has also very likely already passed the threshold. Greenland ice sheet that we thought before was... When you say it's passed the threshold, you mean that it will now tip into something else? It, it tips into something else, and, and it's not as if it crashes overnight, right. but it's irreversible. Gotcha. You know, it simply means that we are on, a, on an unstoppable journey towards worse and worse conditions. And, of course, the, the big uh, scientific fear is that that journey towards less and less livable conditions has feedbacks that amplify warming. So it becomes a self-amplifying factor. Give an example of that, Jan. So one example, the classic example, is when ice melts. So a permanent ice sheet is a white surface. A white surface reflects back 90% of incoming solar radiation back to space. It is a cooling system on planet Earth. We depend, as humanity, on two permanent ice sheets on planet Earth to keep the equilibrium state of the planet. That's what's kept the planet within this plus minus one degree Celsius super fine corridor since we left the last ice age. Ice melts. What happens is it shifts from being a white surface to becoming darker and darker. It absorbs. And darker and darker means absorbing more heat. And there's a very special, precise physical point where you shift from net cooling to net warming, meaning you absorb more than you reflect back to space. That is the point. Yeah. And from that point on, the system, irrespective of what we do, starts rolling in a, Becoming something else. In a different system. A rainforest, you deforest too much, you warm too much, it goes from being a rainforest, self-amplifying, creating its own rain, to instead self-drying. And the tipping point is very precise. We just don't know exactly where it is. The latest science shows us that 20% reduction of, of deforestation combined with global warming can be the tipping point. Then it would irreversibly move to a savanna state. Now that would perhaps take centuries, but it's unstoppable. So the, this is uh, the kind of... And that becomes a carbon producer, not a carbon sink. Yes, and the latest science shows that the Brazilian part of the Amazon rainforest over the last 10 years has already tipped over from being a net carbon sink to now being a carbon source. Now, that's so dramatic. I mean, this is the world's richest land-based ecosystem that, that no longer is our best friend, but is actually an emitter. You know, yeah. it's, it's like the Earth system shifts yeah. over to being itself. Uh, a, a global warming generator. Now, one, so, of the, one of the points you've also made, Johan, is that um, your mother, you know, the natural systems um, ha are, are like this buffer, and they have their own, like your human body, you know? You start to sweat if the temperature gets too hot, you, you're, and you're able to warm yourself if it gets too cold, but you reach a point where the buffering systems mm -hmm. don't work anymore. Yeah. Um, and uh, <clears throat> talk about the ocean in that way, because you, you've, you've talked about it almost like a big mop, but when, when, you, when the mop gets so wet, mm. it can't act as a buffer anymore. Mm. Talk about the ocean in that context. Well, I, I should, I mean, one thing to, to start with to say is that the ocean covers 70% of the surface on planet Earth, but remarkably we have still so many knowledge gaps on, on the biological, particularly, but also physical functioning and, and, and how much buffering capacity the ocean has. But from the knowledge we have today, we know two things to start with. One is that 90% of the heat caused by our fossil fuel burning when temperatures rise are absorbed in the ocean. So that's number one resilience dampening factor. The number two is that 25% of the carbon dioxide is absorbed in the ocean, causing ocean acidification, but it's a tremendous subsidy to the world economy. Now, as long as the ocean is stable and resilient, that can go on, you know, just serving us with this tremendous dampening capacity. The dilemma is that we're seeing signs, cracks in this ability. We are at this exponential point of big data, AI, biotech technologies, a takeoff point on, on social exponential changes. And we know historically that all pathways towards new efficiencies have had rebounds just accelerating the journey in the wrong direction. So when we have had more efficient refrigerators, the only impact of that is that we have bigger and more refrigerators. And now we need to do this within the confines of scientifically defined planetary boundaries because we've reached this 
saturation point. There is no more space to just expand. And the exponentials, because they are completely agnostic, I mean, they don't care about us humans in terms of the technology. So we have to govern this. And I think that's what we're not recognizing, that we now have to be, become the guardians of all these, unleashing all these social exponential technologies. But on the question of science and policy this week, I mean, science is here, I would argue, en masse, uh, more, more equipped than ever before, and across the social sciences and the natural sciences. And just to give you one example, so tomorrow we hand over for the fourth time, actually, the so-called 10 new insights in climate science, directly to Patricia Spinoza, the head of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, which is our effort to, to vacuum clean the 10 most important scientific messages that every climate negotiator needs to have in his or her back pocket <coughs> to be a successful negotiator. So this is handed over and put right into the negotiations tomorrow. But if you haven't done it, go to the IPCC and the World Climate Research Program Pavilion. You have the new cryosphere initiative. It's just phenomenal to see how far science has reached in communicating to policy on the risks we're facing from ice sheet dimensions. I mean, from the Tibetan highlands and the threats to freshwater availability to the ice sheets that we talked about earlier. So I would say that, yes, science is here. But I think the most important role science is playing here today is to provide the solution space. Just look at the carbon pricing discussion we have. I mean, that builds so much on the economics research showing that, you know, not only do we need a carbon price, it gives a much better transition and faster transition towards better outcomes for, you know, health and security and economics. So I think that we have a really important role there. And that's what, as we discussed before coming out on stage here, that, you know, science has to be really clear here. 1.5 degrees Celsius is, from an earth science perspective, still possible from a, from a biophysical perspective. I would even argue personally it's necessary to avoid risks of, of having cascade dynamics, which would self-amplify in the wrong direction. But the drama is that from a social science perspective, it's not very probable. So it's possible, but not probable. What does that mean? Well, it means that that's why we're here in Glasgow, because we need to go from, from the geopolitical inertia over to making the necessary, the, the possible, the reality. And, and that, I think, is what science tries to do every, every minute of, of the days here in Glasgow. Well said. You know, Laurence, um, uh, I, I wrote about, um, a few years ago, a friend of mine had coined the term black elephant. And a black elephant is a cross between the elephant in the room that we can all see and a black swan, mm. a low probability, high impact event. And that, that is how I feel here. We, the elephant's sitting in the room, we can all see yeah. it, and we know it is maybe a low probability, maybe not high probability, but massive impact event. And just to build on the question you were asked, how do we overcome this? And just because I, I was interested, of course, to uh, bounce back on, in particular, Johan, in a way, representation of this conflict of representation of what we can do and how the social science are really uh, concerned with the probability element. And you know, the economic profession has not been very creative. The no. economics profession. Uh, yeah, the economic profession has not been very creative on the no last year. That's you're, such you're, a generous way to say it. You're safe. Yeah, it's charitable. <laughs> it's it's charitable. safe charitable. with this panel. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we cannot do it. Things would be easier later. It will cost less, etc., etc. And you know now, of course, it's because it's exactly because of that, Johan, I do think that this probability element is in a way very past dependent of the way we see reality now. Yeah. And you know, politics reality can change very heavily in the bad sense. Take care of 2024, Andy, elections. Yeah. <laughs> and on the, on, the, on the good sense as well. And I think this is, for example, I see now the central bankers, we are not particularly, of course, keen about talking about climate change, now revising the macroeconomic modeling just to, to understand how they have to react if they want financial stability. Still, they have quite bad models for the moment because the economic profession is, is still, of course, struggling with introducing innovation, <clears throat> dealing with past dependency. Uh, and so we have to make an intellectual progress in the social science as well. And it's that for social psychology, because we need that, because if not, we'll have all these probability element in a way taking us in a way delaying, because we are afraid we cannot do it. 
again, it's, I'm fascinated by the discussion on geopolitics and climate. It's just ridiculous. There is a very good uh, Italian institute, you know, you know well, CMCC, <coughs> Joan in Italy, that just published a report on the cost for G20 countries of climate impacts. These countries, which are so reluctant to engage, and you know only five of them have decent plans for the net zero by 2050, the rest no. And you know, <coughs> they don't connect intellectually the fact that they are very, very exposed to climate change risk. And the cost for them is immense. The cost for China is immense of climate change, as well as US. And you know, it's, it's like we have a deal a contractual transactional approach between big countries not to, in a way, uh, so it's not a deal. Climate is not a deal. You don't, you don't negotiate with climate change. And so that's this incredible, and I do think that is a way the social science have, in a way, representing the reality, whereas it's a cognitive dissonance. And so that, that's the first point. On, on this, how we correct this greenwashing and I do think we have, we have resources, we have elements. Uh, and I hope in Glasgow, and you may have heard Antonio Guterres uh, Monday asking for, he, he want to launch that exercise of honesty. In particular for all the, you know, the actors that are non-parties to the Paris Agreement. Paris Agreement is about, and that's what I conceive, what I call the four pillars at that time in 2015. You have the parties of the, the governments, they have uh, some kind of mechanism or transparency, not perfect by far, but all the others which, and I am very happy of that, as embark on the net zero commitment, like for example companies or investors and e even the, the multilateral financial institutions and the, and the big cities in the world, for the moment there is no system. And, and Antonio Guterres would like to at least set a benchmark with scientific evidence. And then ask, probably, we will have the regulators to do their job and to check. So we can embark now that we have made the commitments, and again, it's very good to have the net zero perspective, to translate now in serious deliverables that can be, that people can be accountable for, keep taken accountable for. And I think it's good, Andy, you have done that with Exxon, huh? the shareholders pressure, the citizen pressure, second very, very important element. The litigation element, we have seen the Dutch court condemn, uh, taking a case and judgment against Shell. We have seen the Karlsruhe court in Germany, incredible judgment, saying the government, you are not delivering seriously on what you commit to. This is a mechanism of power balance we need to create. It's an equilibrium of forces and the social forces, citizen, the citizen, everybody, but the, the line the, would be honesty and seriousness and transparency. And that, you know, was a moral element you were referring to. So that's Thank my response. You. Thank you. I want to be able to give the audience some time, but, you know, we, we, Andy and I had a funny um, moment here. We were, just to remind us how old we are and how long we've been at this, we were walking down here and a, a, a Scottish a policewoman was explaining to one of her young colleagues, there was this guy, his name was Al Gore, and um, he actually predicted a lot of this long before um, this ever happened and made me realize how long uh, that we, we, we've been at, 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 this, at this challenge. The, we have a roving mics um, out there and if anyone has a question, please, uh, please raise your hand and someone with a mic will come to you. And tell us who you are if you have. Yes. <laughs> um, hi Tom, hi everybody. Um, I'm Ingo Stockman from Berlin and from Boston. Um, and greetings from Emory Lovins. <laughs> uh, great. <laughs> um, I have a quick question, uh, Johan, to you. Um, we have reached a tipping point, an economic tipping point in 2017, according to Bloomberg, BNEF. Um, they are showing that new wind and solar is actually cheaper than existing old depreciated coal plants um, since 2017 in Germany, India, China, and the US as well. Why, and you know, I've talked to about 30 delegation members yesterday here at COP, nobody knew this data. Nobody knew that it's cheaper with renewable energy at half the price. That is so nice. Why is that not communicated from science to COP members? Mm. Yeah, no, no th thanks, Ingo. And I'd, I'd like to start by very much self-critically admitting that 
And I don't think it's something that only science is responsible for. We are not good enough at communicating the aggregate cumulative power of the momentum, the positive momentums we're seeing. We actually did, uh, with Christiana Figueres and, uh, and um, you know, the whole Mission 2020, which was already in, in San Francisco at, at the first, um, you know, the, the whole Climate Solutions Summit that was held there after Paris, we produced the first exponential roadmap report, trying to add up exactly this information. What does it add up to? And, and in fact, the data was shocking even to me. It showed that, you know, uh, renewable energy systems, wind and solar, are doubling globally every 5.5 years. And it's been doing so for the past 15 years. But because it starts from such a low point, it's, a, it's barely yeah. visible on the curve. You know, that's why the International Energy Agency for so long was kind of hanging in there saying, sure, this is interesting, <coughs> but it's not, it's not significant on the energy portfolio. But we showed that it has grid parity on the market, as you just point out. It's competitive on the market without subsidies. And if you just project business as usual, doubling every 5.5 years, it's yeah. exponential. You would have 50%, 5-0% of global electricity from solar and wind when? 2030. Mm -hmm. 2030, in nine years' time. So you're right. We have to be much, much better at doing this. We are releasing here in Glasgow the fourth edition of the Exponential Roadmap Report where we're mapping the, the exponential wedges of solutions in the car industry, construction, food industry, uh, you know, energy utilities. We're trying our best, Ingo, to do, to fill that gap. But I think we, we must be much better using technologies to, to really map out, you know, there was a paper just a few months back showing that 29% of small-scale farmers in the world are actually adopting regenerative restoring, resilient, carbon sequestering farming practices. 29% small-scale farmers, indigenous communities. And, and you know, that, that's kind of the, the kind of numbers that shows the, these are not small things. The, the, this is happening. Why is it happening? Well, it's not because everyone wakes up every morning wanting to save the planet. I do, but, <laughs> but not everyone does. <laughs> it's because they see that it has better outcomes. It's more attractive. It's more economically, socially, practically interesting. It it's simply is the narrative of opportunity and success. And I think this is, this is where is that discussion yeah. here? I, I agree. I think we should be unafraid to say that it's more profitable. Yeah. You know, yes. it, it, it makes more <laughs> no, I, money when and, you have more I margin from that. something at a lower cost uh, that, that uh, generates with better attributes and less contingent liabilities. Uh, do you mind if I pick up on this, Tom? Yeah, do, talk about this. Yeah, I, there's, you know, there's only one thing yeah. as powerful as Mother Nature, and that's Father Greed, the market. Yeah, you know? yeah. And, and so if it, you can leverage that, um, you yeah. can really have an impact. Pick yeah, up on and that. And some people, maybe Amory or a few others, either credit or blame me for knowing a few things about energy. But, but uh, so I really want to comment on this. Is a, we, we, at the beginning, when I was a wind developer, you know, in 1999, I started a, a large-scale wind, wind company. Uh, which the people in the wind business thought was nuts uh, because they were predominated by scientists that were trying to beat the bets curve and figure out what the yield was in the airfoil and, you know, et cetera. And I had this crazy idea from an entrepreneurial perspective of a person who didn't know anything about the science of wind. You know, what would happen if we took these windmills and put them where it's really darn windy? That was sort of the new breakthrough, yeah. you know, and, 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 and the, with all respect, because I walk on the shoulder of the giants of the people who developed these turbines, you know, invest this and elsewhere, they weren't really thinking about where to put them as windy. They were thinking about where to put them that a government gave them a subsidy. Nobody actually mm -hmm. said, well, what would happen if we put them in front of a large windy place like the Mistral winds in northern Morocco or something, right? So that did take somebody with some economic or business development uh, uh, background, you know, and, and, and you've got this uh, discussion we're having about economists. Um, you know, I, I, what I'm getting to is people in a swarm people in a hive also need to figure out what kind of bee they are and be the best bee that they can be. You know, there's a reason why economics is called a soft science, because it doesn't use scientific method to problem solve, right? It uses a lot of theory. And there's never been such a thing as an economist who got it right about any of these tipping points. Now, there's the occasional one. They wrote the book, uh, This Time is Different, et cetera. And, 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 and a broken clock is right precisely twice a day. You know, so, so by the odds, an economist is going to be right too, sometimes. But they deal with empiricism, you know, and, and what we say in the world of entrepreneurs is if all you ever do is all you've ever done, all you'll ever get is all you've ever got. 
right? And 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 we can't get what we all used to get uh, used to have. We have to have something completely different, and we have to have it be different by design. So it's not only what is possible or probable about the 1.5; it is what is imperative. And how do we design for the imperative? And when you're designing for technological inflection in the imperative, using your toolkit and imagination to get to the outcome you seek, what we have been leaving out is designing for symbiosis. We have been exempting ourselves from the natural environment because we tame the West, because we conquer nature, because we put a, a, a fence around it and call it a park and say, do not disturb. That is no longer available to us as an option. Nature has to be integrated into the design from the outset so that the technological tools unite the objectives of nature and humanity, you know, sort of for our survival. But, but, but the point I was making about the energy is, whether you're a business or an economic developer who understands those data and numbers, you know, because you shouldn't expect the scientific community to be leading that conversation. That should be led out of the boardrooms of how do we create more margin and more profitability from doing the right thing tantamount to societal goals. But it should be deeply informed by the base realities of scientific method that are telling us, guiding us to what is the outcome state we have to arrive at. You know, remind me one of my mottos covering the, the Middle East, uh, Andy, is that the way you get big change is when you get the big players to do the right thing for the wrong reasons. If you wait for everyone to do the right thing for the right reasons, be they science or morality or whatever, you know, you tend to wait forever. I want to get another question from the floor, though. Uh, Hi, good morning. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is Dan Perel. I represent the Baha'i International Community, coming to you from New York City, a small town on the other side of the Atlantic. <laughs> Um, a quick question. They have a good newspaper there. It's okay. It's yeah. okay. They put together a nice forest, though, that's for sure. Uh, so rapid onset humanitarian disasters, uh, the, the world wars, one and two, you may recall, uh, they caused humanity to advance in the area of, of global governance uh, twice. We now have a slow onset disaster in climate change, and I'm curious what you think it will take for humanity to take the, the next political step. In, in other words, what gives you hope that, in particular, the political leaders of the world, beyond the scientists and economists, uh, that they can find the values and courage necessary to part the Red Sea, as Tom eloquently referenced before. Thanks. Lawrence, go ahead. <coughs> um, of course, there is no miracle moment huh, for political leaders to just, and you know, my conviction is political leaders are thinking within a very narrow political space much, much narrower than even the planet boundaries we have been breaking anyway already for many. And <clears throat> I do think that the way to get them understanding and serious about that, it's about the equilibrium of forces they are seeing. And that's why at that stage now, having now done the Paris Agreement, being in government inside, outside, I do think that the, the only force that can bring them to be more understand, well, just understand the urgency is the voice of citizen. And we see that happening already, in a way. I, I do think that because I saw, you, you know, when you are in a government, have been there during many years, you, you see only the vested interest, and not, not negatively only, but people who are organized and, and tell you that you can do that and you cannot do that. That will be that's the incrementalism element. And the, the looking forward on the really a big change, a societal change, no, nobody wants to talk to you about that because you have to, in a way, deliver, in particular in our democracy, short-term responses. And so the, the only way is to widen this space, to make them understand that the societies are ready, demanding that change, and that the citizens themselves have a lot of tools to imagine this future, which will be radically different. And well, it's important because, you know, <clears throat> a number of elements are about just, and that's what I wanted to build on, on what you said, Andy, and, and what you said. It, we have to understand that it's not about increasing all the time. We have to shift from the extractivist vision of the, our systemic uh, behaviors and, and system to something different. Because, again, even if we have the cheapest solar energy, more efficient, etc. We cannot cover the earth with solar panels. 
So we have to understand the planet boundaries issue. So we have to, in a way, be l much lighter on how c we cannot mine ev every, every area. So well, one more question before we go. Thank you for that, though. Just we have time for one more quick one? I think we need to close. We have to close. <laughs> so um, uh, thank you very much, uh, Laurence. Uh, Johan, Andy, this was great. And thank you all for being here. Thank you very much, Tom. Thank you, everyone, for this uh, great conversation.